presenting for us for this next hour, Jackie Clare. After practicing law with Juan Ball, Carl, Sandridge, and Rice, Jackie became a DRC certified Superior Court mediator in 1993. And since that time has devoted her professional career to a full-time mediation practice, having mediated over 6,000 cases, primarily in the areas of workmen or workers' compensation, personal injury, business bankruptcy, and medical malpractice. Jackie is a recipient of the 2013 Lawyers Weekly Women of Justice Litigation Practitioner Award, the NCBA Dispute Resolution Section Peace Award, and is included as one of the best lawyers in America and a North Carolina super lawyer for her work in mediation. She has served as a member of the NCBA Board of Governors and the North Carolina Dispute Resolution. Oh, right right here. Okay. Hey, hey, hey. Don't interrupt. She is the past chair of the NCBA Dispute Resolution Section and past chair of the NCBA Women in Profession Committee. Jackie is an adjunct professor at Campbell Law School teaching mediation adv advocacy. She received her BA degree from Eastern Carolina University and her JD degree with honors from the University of North Carolina School of Law. Tom Clare practiced with an insurance defense firm, T. Campbell, Dennis, and Gorm from 1987 to 2007 where he handled a variety of cases, including personal injury, commercial litigation, and workers' compensation, with a concentration in asbestos and other occupational disease claims. His experience also includes a number of jury trials in both state and federal court, and he has argued cases before the North Carolina Court of Appeals, the North Carolina Supreme Court, and the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. Tom became certified mediator in 2001 and has mediated thousands of cases in a variety of practice areas, including workers' compensation, toxic torts, personal injury, insurance coverage, and commercial litigation. From January 2008 to April 2011, he was the resident partner in the Raleigh office of Oxnard, Thomas, and Kumar, PLLC, where he concentrated his practice in the representation of plaintiffs and workers' compensation cases. Tom is a past member of the uh, North Carolina Dispute Resolution Commission and was chair of the New Media Committee. Tom is now a full-time mediator and is mediating cases statewide in North Carolina. And that leads me to last, but definitely not least, George Patrick Doyle, who is gonna be very loud uh, and entertaining this presentation, I can feel it. He has practiced law in Orange County and Chatham County for over 40 years. Dates you just a little bit, kid. During that time, he has worked in the criminal and civil courts of both counties. In 1992, Mr. Doyle became one of the first certified mediators in the North Carolina Mediated Settlement Program. He has been certified by the North Carolina Dispute Resolution Commission to mediate uh, civil superior court matters, family law matters, and certain matters before the clerk of superior court. He is also a mediator in the Industrial Commission's work, Workers' Compensation Program and a district court arbitrator in the 15th B Judicial District. Mr. Doyle is a member of the North Carolina Bar Association, the criminal law section, the workers' compensation section, the family law section, and the dispute resolution section. He is the former chair of the NCBA dispute resolution section and the NCBA criminal law section. His ADR skills have been enhanced and improved by his various associations with colleagues in the North Carolina Bar Association. Mr. Doyle holds an undergraduate degree in political science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a law degree from Northern Illinois University. Woo. All right, y'all have a, a great group in front of you. Please enjoy the program. Ladies and gentlemen, take it away. Thanks, Tara. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. It talks about open system preferences and uh, this may be way beyond my technical abilities here. Um, so let's see. I take it that's not sharing. So um Tara, can you uh take care of that for me? I hate to put you on the spot there, but you do have that, right? I do. It's open your PowerPoint's opening up now. Let me get it situated and I will share it. Just uh tell me when you want to switch. We'll just say, Colleen, that was amazing. Your technical abilities were amazing, and the stump the mediator questions were um, fun and um, and challenging. Um, so thanks, thanks for that. Um, while Tara is pulling that up, I just want to thank Tara for asking us to speak. 
Um, and when we were trying to figure out what we wanted to talk about, you know, we wanted to keep it with communication, communication with the attorneys, the parties in the court. And Tara told us about inquiries she's gotten over the past year. And so we decided to focus on that and answer those. So we have Tara's inquiries, and then we have some hypotheticals that George prepared that are exciting and fun. And, um, and so we'll uh, try to go over those. Thank you, Tara, that looks great. Um, and, um, and so we'll do that. And, and, and so what we're gonna do is, is draw on the standards, the advisory opinions and the rules, because really those are where our answers are. Um, and the way we've got the PowerPoint set up, it's going to be the inquiries that Tara had, and then toward the end, it'll have hypotheticals, and those are the ones that George came up with. Um, and so, obviously, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and um, Maureen will uh, let us know about those questions. So, um, Tara, if you could move to the uh, move two more slides to inquiry one. Or can I control that? You'd have to do that. I'm sorry. Okay. George. All right. Good morning, everybody. What an honor to be with the Claire's. Uh, I'm just, <laughs> I was hired to be just the pretty face here. Uh, so <laughs> you all can read this, but, but, but uh, I'll read it for emphasis. So we have defendants C and D. They haven't responded to the suit. Summary judgment has been uh, entered in f uh, getting rid of defendant B. Does the case need to be mediated? And uh, we're going to go to Jackie Claire for that answer. Okay, so interestingly enough, yesterday I was mediating a case where um, I hear during the general session that defendant filed a third party complaint against another party. And so I was starting to panic because I realized I didn't know about them. I had not invited them to the media. You know, I didn't, I did not realize that I, you know, that there was someone else involved. Um, and so I was panicking. And, you know, I didn't say anything yet. And then finally, the defense attorney said they had a default against the um, uh, third party uh, defendant. And so that kind of goes to um, this this question. So defendant B is out and defendant C and D have not responded to the suit. I am gonna assume, and again, this is an inquiry that Tara received. I'm gonna assume there's not been a default yet of defendant C and D. And I guess Tara, if you wanna go to the next slide, I'm sorry, <laughs> next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> and, um, this, these are the sources that we drew from when we were trying to answer the question. So, obviously, under the uh, Settlement Conference Rule 6B5, that says that you have the duty to schedule and hold the Mediated Settlement Conference. It says it is your duty to do that. And so, um, <clears throat> you know, there's an order in place to mediate the case. And, and therefore, that's where the duty comes from. And um, so, you know, what do you do? Um, I mean, I've, you know, I've had this. One of the parties hadn't, you know, they, they're non-responsive. You, you try, you know, I can contact the plaintiff's attorney, ask, do you have any, uh, have an email, have a telephone form? And often they do. And that's how um, I get in touch with the parties that have been non-responsive. And quite often they, you know, they do, you know, respond to you when, um, <clears throat> but let's say that you just can't get a response. You at least try to, you know, mail a letter to the address that's on the um, uh, designation that comes from the court or the order from the court um, so that you've at least tried to um, get in touch with them that way. And normally I will get a phone call from that. I wanted to go ahead and mention advisory opinion one um, and note that that was the very first advisory opinion of the DRC. Um, and, and that's because, and I know you've had this, you know, you'll have attorneys call, and I'm digressing here, have attorneys call and say, you know, we've already talked, this is going to, you know, be a waste of time, go on and just declare an impasse. And you all know you, you can't do that. I mean, when you file the report, it says that you've mediated it. 
and and so you're not being truthful on the report but also under rule 6b5 you have that duty and then advisory opinion one that's exactly what they had the attorneys called and said you know it's going to be a waste of time we don't want to move to dispense because we don't want the court upset with us that's what one of the attorneys had said and so you know the mediators got to go on and, and have the mediation now during this time where we have remote mediations that are available it's a lot easier um because everybody can hop on zoom or, or have a teleconference um, under the rules, um, and we can have that mediation where somebody is not flying in, they aren't driving. And so obviously, not only under 6B5, but the advisory opinion, um, you're under a duty to, uh, to mediate this case. The other thing is just where the authority for all that comes from, and that's the general statute that you're all familiar with, 7A-38.1. Under A, it talks about the purpose, and it says that um, it's to require parties to superior court civil actions and their representatives to attend a pretrial mediated settlement conference. And so you are indeed required to uh, try to have a mediation. You send the notices out, and then if someone doesn't appear, obviously you put on your report who the um, um, who the uh, um, sorry, I just saw saw a chat there and got distracted. Um, you put who attended the mediation conference. So let's see if you can go to the uh, second inquiry. I mean, I'm sorry, the second, the next slide. Thank you. So this question is for Tom. May the mediator act as an escrow agent for the parties while waiting for a condition to be fulfilled after a mediation conference? Um, Jackie, the answer is no. Tara, next slide. Thank you. <laughs> no way. Uh, speaking of Tara, um, in a recent conversation with Jackie, about this issue or a similar issue, Tara uh, said, uh, stay in your lane, which is excellent advice for mediators. Uh, and in this particular case, it, it would mean you're there to be the mediator. You're not there to be the escrow agent or to perform some other duty. You're there to serve as a neutral, to help the parties discuss their dispute and perhaps resolve their dispute. And you should focus on that and anything that goes outside of that lane, you should think about it real hard. Um, so, in this particular inquiry, uh, the question was, can the mediator serve as the escrow agent while waiting for a condition to be fulfilled after the mediation conference? And no surprise, the answer really is no. Um, there's a, uh, an advisory opinion that's pretty close. Uh, it's advisory opinion 15, which we mentioned in the sources page, uh, where the question was whether the mediator can serve as an administrator or fiduciary of an estate uh, after mediating the case. And the DRC said no. There's a couple of standards that uh, come into play. One is impartiality. Uh, and with regard to being the escrow agent, uh, you're, you're going to be performing a duty, uh, which is probably going to benefit the parties. I mean, I don't, I, I have never been an escrow agent, but, uh, in some cases that are certainly compensated, I would think, but even if they're not being compensated, you're performing a service that is of value to the parties, which could make one, depending on how that service is performed, it could make one party or the other unhappy depending on what exactly you have to do as the escrow agent and whether it, if there's any discretionary work involved as to how you, how you handle the assets that are involved. Uh, but you don't want to do anything which will uh, make one party or the other question your impartiality. So that's one problem. Uh, it raises the conflict of interest. Why are you doing it? Um, you're serving as the escrow agent, hypothetically, uh, in in response to a request from the parties. So you're doing something for them. And why are you doing it? Well, you just want to help. Well, are you doing it 
to uh, perhaps convince them that you're just a great person and they should continue to hire you as a mediator? If so, that's a conflict of interest. Um, you're not there to improve your business. Uh, if you're such a wonderful mediator that they like you and want, you, want to use you again, that's great. But you shouldn't be performing auxiliary services for them, hoping to get a future business from the parties. Um, rule, the rule of professional conduct for attorneys, uh, rule 1.12 is analogous. It's not directly on point, but that talks about when uh, a mediator is subsequently asked to serve as an attorney uh, in a related matter for one of the parties. Uh, that's not exactly what's going on here, but it's, a, but it's analogous. Um, you should just think about, you know, are you getting out of your lane and is it going to create problems? And in this particular hypothetical, it definitely would create problems. Um, the comments to that uh, rule of professional conduct all also uh, address whether a mediator may negotiate for employment with a party in a mediation. Uh, and, you know, no, you, you shouldn't be doing that. And, and again, this, you, you know, you're not asking for a job as an escrow agent, but I, maybe, maybe you are thinking of that. Uh, you know, if, if an escrow agent is something is that you do normally, that, that's a service that you have provided in the past and would hope to provide in the future for other parties, then you might sort of be auditioning for a job. Um, yeah, you were a great escrow agent. So let's hire you to do that. And again, that's not staying in your lane. You're the mediator. Uh, so focus on being the mediator and try not to be anything else. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably be discussing some similar situations uh, in the next few minutes, uh, which kind of fall into the ca same category. Just stay in your lane. Be the mediator. Uh, I guess I'll the answer add I'll, I'll add to that, I guess, um, I think when Tara and I were talking about this, you know, obviously, as Tara said, stay in your lane. Um, but, you know, sometimes there might be, you know, you need to make a, uh, you know, you might need to hold funds until a, I mean, they might ask you to hold funds until a contingency is satisfied, that type of thing. And so the thought was, if the mediator has no discretion, everybody agrees to it, maybe that could be done. I, but I would, I would just advise against it. Best practice is not to do that. Um, just with all of these pitfalls that Tom just went over, it's just you know there are other folks who can take care of this, um, and um, and so I would definitely avoid that. And you know, Jackie, the question is, where would you hold that that money? Would you hold that in your attorney trust account, which is a, a, an account that's restricted to holding client funds? You know, you're supposed to do an accounting. I mean, it's a minefield. Real estate lawyers who hold money for disputing parties hate to be stuck in the middle. Mediators don't want to go there either. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so I guess the next slide, Tara. <laughs> okay, inquiry number three. Plaintiff and defendant cannot agree on the selection of a mediator. In a hearing before the judge, plaintiff expresses a desire to use mediator A and defendant objects to using mediator A. The judge states that mediator A is a fine mediator and orders mediator A to conduct the mediation. What does mediator A do? Yeah this, yeah, this actually happened to me. People wanted to get rid of me. No, actually, that's not true. <laughs> uh, uh, if you look at the sources, Tara, if we could move to the sources that answer this question. Again, it raises the question of impartiality. Can you be neutral with these kinds of facts happening to you at a time? And, of course, the, the standard three about confidentiality. So... I think the media is between a rock and a hard place, but I've forgotten the answer, Jackie. What was the answer to this? <laughs> it's always exciting presenting with you, George. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you keep me on my toes. Well, well, one thing that occurred you know, to me. And this, you oh, know. Tom was speaking. Can Tom speak first? Yes, he, he may speak. <laughs> well, just one thing that occurred to me, if if the defendant has objected to using mediator A, you know why? I mean, you've already got a situation where one of the parties doesn't want you to mediate the case. Exactly. So, 
right there. I mean, you shouldn't because you're either going to, as the mediator, you're, you know, the possibility is that uh, if you end up mediating it, uh, you'll know that party didn't want you to mediate it. So you may bend over backwards to make that party happy or, you know, you're just going to or, or you're going to be ticked off that they didn't want you. And so you might go the other way and, you know, lean towards the other party. So it just it just creates a mess. Well, I, uh, I see there's a question in the chat. How did mediator A find out there was a hearing apparently and and. Oh, and how did the mediator find out? Well, that's an interesting question. Tara might be able to tell us that, but my guess is, you know, one of the party that didn't want the mediator probably told them that that's what occurred. So let's assume that's what occurred. Um, and um, so that, that's a good question. Um, you know, first of all, I guess once you find out about that, you could just reach out to that attorney and just say, hey, just checking in, I've been appointed, I understand you might have some problems with me, and it may be something benign that is just not a problem. Um, you know, they might have been mistaken about something. So understand or two, you know, you should reach out. And then, you know, to Tom's point about, you know, either they're mad at you or you're going to get mad at them. I mean, can you be impartial um, under the standards? If they continue to object, then you're going to want to um, get out of the case, withdraw. Or if you feel like you cannot be impartial, you're going to want to get out of the case under um, under impartiality. And then under standard 3C, obviously that relates to communication with the court. You've got to be careful about how you get out of the case. You, sure. um, you know, would just say that you're withdrawing because um, um, a conflict has arisen, or you don't you don't want to let the court know. Now, obviously, this judge um, uh, wanted um, that mediator to go ahead and mediate the case. Maybe that judge thought, you know, that mediator could could get this resolved. But uh, the mediator needs to um, withdraw if the mediator cannot remain impartial or if that party is continuing to object. And in this situation, we have to comply with the standards. Um, and so we have to pay attention to that. You know, Jackie, I often get appointed by the Industrial Commission to mediate a workers' comp case. And then I contact the attorneys and they say, oh, the form got crossed in the mail. Uh, we we decided and have designated another mediator, and uh, uh, and we hope you'll waive your fee. So I hope Tara, you don't mind that I don't. If it's just that, uh, I don't. I do waive the, the the substitution fee. Now sometimes they'll say, you know, we're not going to hire you. Uh, we're going to hire Tom Clare, and I go. Tom Clare, I don't really know who he is, but, you know, good luck. Um, anyway, inquiry four. Why would you do such a thing? <laughs> well, you know, I want to say the rules say that the person, when they substitute the mediator, the person has to say that they've paid the um, the original yeah. mediator's uh, fees, admin fee, and that sort of thing. And so... The, the mediator actually is encouraged to charge that. And I think part of that is to um, to prevent this very thing. You know, attorneys need to get the designations in. Now, I will say that I, you know, I'll wave mine when things cross in the mail like that. Um, and so, uh, but I think they encourage us not to wave it. So. All right. And I'm, I'm going to speak on that just because it's, it's not only do we encourage you not to wave it, but technically they are Supreme Court rules. And I recently had um, an email or received an email from court staff in Superior Court saying, deal with this. And it was the situation where the court appointed a mediator, the parties the next day came back and said, oh, we're so sorry. We just delayed in getting our designation in. We'd really like to use a different party. Um, and court staff get stuck in the middle because technically under the rules, court staff is not allowed to complete the substitution until the mediator, the original appointed mediator has confirmed they received the funds. Okay. So that is, that is our position and we're sticking with it. Right. 
charge the fee. Now, in a reality world, uh, where I'm definitely not encouraging anyone to violate the Supreme Court rules, um, should you determine to take an alternate path, make sure you make the parties aware of the true path because we have new mediators every day coming in who charge that fee and old school, and I'm old school, so I get to say that, attorneys come in and say, well, that's ridiculous. I've never been charged that fee before, and it causes all kinds of drama, okay? So just be aware of the rules and be aware that we uh, promote the rules strongly. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. I appreciate that uh, clarification. I will follow your lead. Um, so, if we'll move on to inquiry four, plaintiff and defendant have met with the mediator prior to suit, and they asked that mediator to mediate the case. Can the mediator recommend people to conduct a business evaluation, which we're going to presume is going to be part of the mediation? And that is to be answered by the beautiful Tom Clare. <laughs> and the answer is no. Next question. Thank you. <laughs> Um, and, and again, th this should be the theme of the day, you know, stay in your lane. No. Yeah. And, and this one is really, really no. I mean, I just, as, as George just said, the business evaluation is apparently going to be the meat of the mediation. So mediator can't be getting involved in that. That is absolutely just roaming way, 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 way out of your lane. Uh, you're going to pick someone who, you know, you know, and for whatever reason you think would do a good job, well, one, why are you picking that particular person? Are you expecting to get some benefit from choosing that person? Uh, not from the parties, which I'll get to in a minute, but from that person you pick as the business evaluator. Um, you know, that's, that, that's wrong. Uh, that creates a conflict of interest because you're doing it then for your own personal benefit. So that's a problem. But the bigger problem is you, you pick a business evaluator, they do an evaluation, pretty unlikely, uh, it, it's pretty unlikely that both parties are going to like that evaluation. If they both agreed on the value of the business and the value of the business is really what the dispute is about, well, then they probably wouldn't be mediating. So the result of that evaluation is going to be an, eva a, a, an opinion that is gonna make one of the parties unhappy. So that creates impartiality problems. Uh, you have caused uh, an appearance of bias because you picked the person that made one of the parties unhappy. So that, that's, that's a big problem. Um, we mentioned standard six, uh, legal and other professional advice. It might not be legal advice, but it's, it's probably professional advice. You are choosing that evaluator hypothetically because you know something about them and you have an opinion based upon your professional experience uh, as to whether that person would do a good job. So you're inserting your own advice into the mediation and under standard six, again, stay in your lane, be the mediator. Don't be giving professional advice or legal advice uh, to the parties. So, and, and I guess I'll just add here, you know, under standard six, it, it talks about if you're, you know, if you have a lot of knowledge in that area and you're comfortable in that, it, you know, in your position, you know, you may, um, 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 you may end up doing that. And, and I mean, it's not saying you can do this particular thing, but that's, you know, what you might be looking at when you're looking at standard six, but it, and you're just really tempted to do something like that. You know, the parties are going to, or the, you know, I don't know anybody who does that. Do you know someone who does that? And if this is your practice area, you know people who do this. And so you're going to be inclined to want to do that. But as, as Tom was saying, there, there are just too many um, issues involved with this. And again, you're, you're going to want to um, stay in your lane. Um, I'm sorry. I was I was looking at the um, at the chat. I've got to stop doing that. I got, I need to leave that up to Maureen. Um, and so this is just a reminder that these are inquiries that Tara has gotten. We we did not make these up. Well, we sort of embellished them. Tara, do you want to uh, address the uh, uh, questions in the chat about that waiving mediator fee, or do we not have enough time to do that? Um, I can certainly address them, except I haven't seen them. So okay, all right, all right. 
then then we can Tara move Taylor. on. Uh, I'll read you the question, Tara. The question is, what if a party objects after mediator discloses potential conflict? Does mediator still charge the fee? So the fee um, attaches a court appointment. Um, so you have to understand that court appointment cases are very, very small. It's a small number of the cases that come through. Typically about 95% of the cases that go through our programs designate their mediator. Um, if you um, find a conflict that the fee is specifically meant and intended, and I believe the, the rule even talks about um, being appointed based on the lack of the attorneys filing their actual designation. So if there is a conflict of interest and it's at the fault of no one, then no, do not charge a fee. Um, and if you're worried about violating the rules on that, I don't think that would be an issue, but call me. I'll put it in my magical book of ethical questions that will give you a get out of jail free card should that ever come back to bite your ankles. George, does that cover it? Yes, thank you so much. Sure. Thank Maureen, you. any other questions? Yes. Um, can you advise that they get evaluation without suggesting evaluator? That, that, that's a good question. Um, I think that you can, I, I would think that you can do that in the way that we sort of suggest things to parties and mediations without directly suggesting them, like just say, so what if, you know, would getting a business evaluator be a good idea? What do you think about that? Um, I think that'd be all right. I don't know, Jackie, George, what do y'all think? I agree, I agree. Right, and I see one of the questions says, you know, as part of the settlement, the uh, parties are gonna be bound by evaluation of evaluator or appraiser, parties can agree on the evaluator, evaluator and the, they want the mediator, I should not read aloud, and they want the mediator to appoint one as part of the settlement. Um, and I just think, you know, as part of the settlement, I think the the uh, the attorneys or you know the parties need to come up with their own um, yeah. um, evaluator. I mean, they can you know look that up online. If they you know, I just don't think the the mediator should get involved because ultimately somebody's going to be unhappy with that valuation. And they're going to say, well, you know, they were pretty conservative in their valuation. I mean, because we all know that about different, you know, uh, I mean, the cases I've been involved in, it's amazing the different appraisals that you get. Um, and so I just think we have to be careful with that. And I, I agree. Um, there's, there's one more question, which is sort of a digression, but I think it's a good question. Could you discuss parameters of giving advice? Uh, in a mediation with one pro se party and one representative in the more experienced, sophisticated party. Um, and that I've done, I guess we've, we've all done some pro se mediations. Um, and that is, uh, George had a good word earlier. That's a minefield. Uh, you just gotta be real careful. And I spent half my time emphasizing to the pro se party that I am not your lawyer. Um, and in most of the cases that I've done with a pro se, it's been in my, area of specialization uh and so i was very no not not very knowledgeable but i knew something um i knew more than the pro se party did uh and i certainly could give them advice but i had to be real careful and, and, and workers comp was my area and so i would tell them things that were not opinions uh for instance if you go to a hearing then it is going to take you know, a couple of three months or however many months afterwards to get a decision. That's, that is not a matter of opinion. That's the way it works. Um, but you just have to be really, really, really careful and um, lean towards not saying something. If you have any question in your mind as to whether it, it is legal advice, um, because one, you're affecting the integrity of the process. You're um, interfering with the party's ability to make their own decisions you, know, you might be interfering in a good way by giving them legal advice but still it's supposed to be the parties who make their decisions two you're creating liability for yourself i mean you don't want a pro se party coming back uh after a settlement that turns out to be not in their favor perhaps or they don't like it and they say well the mediator told me such and such the mediator advised me you know that you know this is how it worked you know whatever you just have to be really really careful um so 
So uh, yes, just be very, very careful. And if, if you have any question in your mind as to whether it's legal advice, don't do it. Uh, t- Tom, since we're talking basics, uh, it's probably worth going over this issue again. So you're in a workers' comp mediation, and the claimant's lawyer, you know, turns to you and says, "You know, you've been on the other side, Tom. You know how these insurance companies think. Do you think I should take? Should I agree to this clincher? Do you think this is fair to my client?" What do and, you do? and that does raise um, the wording, or that brings it. There is wording in, in the standards which say after the parties have exhausted their resources, and they ask you, you know, basically as a last resort, what do you think? Um, you can, and of course, the devil is in the details. Right. Um, but if they're telling you, look, we're, you know, we have just exhausted our you know, resources here. We really don't know what to do. What do you think? Um, under the language of that standard, you can, but you should think about it very hard before doing it. You got to be real, real careful. Um, you know, if you're, if you're just absolutely convinced that, yeah, this is their best option and they're really wanting you to give the opinion, it's okay. It does, that doesn't happen much, but you can do it in the right case. So I'll add in here that standard five self-determination standard five C. Um, I want to move on just to make sure we go over all the slides. Um, Tara, do you mind um, going to the next? Yeah. Okay, Tom. All right, inquiry five, case settled. If party A pays party B, party B will dismiss the case. If party A does not pay party B, party B will file a confession of judgment. How does mediator communicate this information to the court on the report of mediator form? Jackie. Okay. So, obviously, y'all know under standard 64, we have to file a report with the court. And it has to, you know, say if the case settled and what documents going to be filed. But, and, you know, many of you may have had this, I'll mediate, you know, particularly in a business case they'll have a settlement and there's going to be a payment schedule. And I think Colleen is going to talk about this as well. So obviously if she wants to weigh in, um, I, um, you know, uh, we have to worry about standard um, 3C on confidentiality, what we communicate to the court. Um, And under standard 3D1, there's an exception you can communicate with the court on procedural matters that might aid in the mediation, but we've already had this mediation. What do we do about reporting it? And so what I do in the mediation, when we're putting together the agreement, and let's say it says they're going to make a monthly payment over the course of three months. um, And if they miss a payment, then um, plaintiff can file a confession of judgment where, you know, the defendant normally like says, you know, if I miss a payment, I'll be liable for more. And then they enter that uh, judgment. Or if they make the payments as set out in the settlement agreement, then the voluntary dismissal with prejudice will be filed. And so, you know, I used to kind of, you know, I'd fill out my report and put, yeah, we have an agreement. I'm like, check two boxes or what, you know, but that's like, that's, the, you know, am I telling the court too much, you know, on the confession of judgment? And so what I started doing, I mean, it basically depends on the TCA in each district. Mm-hmm. What I started doing was asking the attorneys to email the TCA like that day or the next morning tell them we have an agreement and they end up telling the court what the situation is. And that way I'm not having to communicate this confidential information. And they say, you know, can we, can this be put on inactive status? Um, Can you, you know, put it on the admin calendar six months from now, that sort of thing. And each TCA has kind of a different way of doing it. I talked to Deneen Barrier who is in, Um, Durham County, um, and she was very helpful, said, you know, I could tell you that I talked to her, and she was saying that the AOC is monitoring the age of cases, and they're, you know, she, she 
you know, wants to see a short fuse. And those of you who've mediated cases where, you know, a debtor, for example, just they don't have that much money and it's a pretty extended monthly payment, um, you know, the, the, the courts are not going to like that. Um, and, you know, she says they might put it back on the administrative calendar, um, but, it, it, you know, they prefer not to have that. You know, what else can be done? Maybe the plaintiff can take, an inv uh, take a voluntary dismissal without prejudice, but, you know, plaintiff's attorneys don't want to use up that card. Um, although, it, you know, you've got an agreement, so it shouldn't be a problem. Um, so all that just comes down to, I let the attorneys give that information to the court. I don't want to violate standard 3C. Um, and in that email, when they've given that information to the trial court coordinator or trial court administrator, and they say, well, you know, I'll talk, take it off the admin calendar. I will then reply all and say, what would you like for me to do with my report of mediator? And they usually let me know. Um, and so I think that's the safest way to try to handle it because you don't want to go, well, there's going to be a payment schedule. And if they can't pay within six months that, you know, because all of a sudden you're given information about the case. Um, I agree. All right. Um, <laughs> And there's some great questions in the chat. I, I we just can't get to all of them, Tara. Uh, we we need to do this again soon. Uh, we probably should move, if I may, Jackie, on to inquiry six. Uh, Tara, can you? Which is mediator has been appointed to mediate a case between plaintiffs A and B. Mediator learns that B has another case pending on the same issue with another plaintiff C parties will not communicate with each other. Can the mediator ask the court to consolidate these cases, these mediations, Tom, George, why don't I just tell you, stay in your lane, man. <laughs> I really, I, I know this, brother. I mean, I did, if this happened, well, why is the mediator doing this? Do they That's want to be a trial court administrator now and they want to decide? how to allocate mediations. I mean, I just don't understand why you would even think to do this, but the standards that are implicated here, standard three confidentiality, and that if you do end up consolidating the cases, which is a really, really bad idea, but if it happens, then you've got two separate cases being mediated simultaneously, which raises the question that AO 34 addresses, which is whether, I, and I don't, I don't know why this is wrong, but can a mediator conduct two mediations at once and bill for them both at the same time? And the, the DRC, much to my amazement, said, no, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> one of the things they discussed was confidentiality. You're going back and forth between two rooms, which are two different cases, and you might get the facts mixed up, information mixed up, and you end up disclosing information to parties who aren't in the case that you think you're talking about at the time. And it just, it's, it's just a mess. Um, standard six legal advice. If you have some legal theory as to why the cases could be, uh, or should be consolidated, you know, keep it to yourself. Um, you know, that's not a good idea to tell the court what to do uh, on the allocations of, of mediations or consolidating cases. Um, and standard seven, the conflict of interest. Why are you doing this? Uh, are you hoping to get more business by, you know, combining the two cases or maybe make it a big mediation that you'll allow to, it'll allow you to bill more. There's just all kinds of things wrong with this idea. So no, stay in your lane, uh, do what the court tells you, uh, and just mediate the one case. And if you get appointed to mediate the other case, fine, mediate that one, but don't, Tell the court what to do about consolidating cases. Um, I guess so that we can. I'm sorry, George, did you have something? Oh, I, I was just affirming Tom's answer. I guess so that we can try to cover all these if we could move to the next slide, um, Tara. So, mediator is contacted by lien holder after mediation conference is scheduled, but before date of conference to inquire about specifics of the upcoming conference. May the mediator communicate with the lien holder. 
No. <laughs> the, the the rules are very specific. Uh, the rule four B says that uh, we have a duty to notify lien holders, but beyond that, the mediation is confidential, and you cannot discuss with lien holders. That would be a gross violation. Uh, I, in workers' comp cases, I've had sometimes employers call me before the mediation and say, you know, he was a terrible employee or a good employee or trying to uh, uh, breach the confidentiality. I'll just repeat, Tom, this is going outside your lane. Yep. So yep. I guess I'll add to that um, under 4B, the notifying lien holders, that's up to the attorneys to notify the lien exactly. holders and not the mediator and under 4A on attendance, you know, the lien holders aren't listed as, as the party who should be there. And we were blessed with advisory opinion 41 that addresses this very issue. Uh, so if you're contacted, if it's a mediated settlement conference and the designation is on file, you know, there's public knowledge that you've been appointed. So you can say, yes, I've been appointed and then refer them to uh, the attorneys and at the industrial commission, if you're mediation, mediating a comp case, there's a question about, you know, is that really public knowledge? And so I don't think you should even really uh, confirm that you're, you know, the mediator, even though they've probably talked to one of the attorneys. Um, and obviously under standard three confidentiality, they're not a participant. And so you can't talk to them about um, about the case. Once they become a participant, once they attend, then obviously you uh, treat them just as as a party. Um, and, you know, I, I get contacted by lien holders. And after this advisory opinion came out, I got an email from um, a company that you are all familiar with that tries to enforce the liens. And they were saying, you know, here's the contact. You need to contact this person during the mediation. It was an email and it was glorious. I replied and I said, I direct your attention to advisory opinion 41. And I provided the link and just said, you know, I just went, period. And I never heard from them again. And so, you know, it's just fabulous to be able to do that. So Tara, thank you for um, uh, having the commission look at that. So let's go to the next slide because we are running out of time. <clears throat> all right, so, so, so I, 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 I think you're George's. All right. So <laughs> uh, I'm mediating an age and gender discrimination case. Uh, and the uh, lawyer for the defendant, and this is where I started to embellish, the lawyer for the, uh, the company says, we didn't fire her because of her age or her gender. We fired her because tomorrow uh, our company is going to get FDA approval on a blockbuster drug and like the stock price is going to triple or quadruple. And she leaked that. So that's why we fired her. So I, you know, I thought, well, that's interesting. And the case did not settle. So the next day I'm talking, and we don't know what we have in our mutual funds. So the next day I'm talking to my advisor and he's saying, you know, you're paying too much capital gains tax and we need to reduce some things and, and you've got some stock in this very company and we think they're a bad stock and we want to sell it today because we think the stock's going down. And you're going, oh my God, the stock is going to quadruple in value. I can retire and get to that beach house. What do you do, Jackie? Oh, uh, Tom, this is Tom. Tom. No. This is Tom. Thank you, George. Uh, no, don't do it. Um, no. So there is a standard that is just absolutely perfectly on point. Standard 7E. A mediator shall not use information obtained or relationships formed during a mediation for personal gain or advantage. And this just falls squarely within that. If if you know you have the stock and you know that the value is going to be affected by the information you received in the mediation, you can't do anything. You got. I think you just got to sit there and you know, whether, no matter which way it goes. Uh, well, but if you know you're going to take a hit, you know, sorry, but that was going to happen anyway, unless you obtain that information, which was obtained confidentially uh, in the processes of mediation. So there's other rules um, which come into play, which George mentioned the. Uh, Mutual fund situation. I was, if you assume that the mediator 
knows he has stock, so it's not a mutual fund, and he knows he has shares in the company that's involved in the mediation, that's a potential conflict which should be revealed or discussed uh, under rule, Superior Court Mediation Rule 6B2, disclosure. Uh, standard 2B also addresses disclosure. Uh, and then, of course, standard three confidentiality would come into play if you said something to your stockbroker about it. But, uh, but yeah, if if you you just cannot use the information that you obtained in mediation in any way, so you just got to pretend you never heard it. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, Tom, you're right. All right, <laughs> George, don't tell us don't tell us what you ended up doing. We don't want to know. <laughs> I didn't get the beach house. Uh, so what are the mediators <laughs> duties? And, and we lawyers run into this sometimes. Uh, what is the mediators duty? If during the mediation, you learn of spousal abuse. Or child abuse during the mediation, or you're doing the family financial case and you find out that 1 of the parties did. Uh, did not was not totally truthful on their pre-trial equitable distribution affidavit. Jackie, what do you do? Okay, on the first one, um, in regard to spousal or child abuse, you know, I think you all know the answer to this. Under standard three, obviously we have confidentiality, but there are exceptions. And under it says notwithstanding the confidentiality provisions, a mediator may report otherwise confidential conduct or statements made before, during, or after mediation in the following circumstances. So this is standard 3D. And under four, if public safety is at issue, then a mediator may disclose otherwise confidential information to participants, non participants, law enforcement personnel, or other persons potentially affected. Um, if the party um, uh, has communicated to the mediator a threat of serious bodily harm or death to any person and the mediator has reason to believe the party has the intent and ability to act on the threat. Um, so, you know, bottom line, if there is spousal abuse or child abuse uh, under that exception, you can report that to the proper folks and obviously under standard two impartiality. You know, you're not going to be able to be impartial anymore once you know you've got like, you know, a wife beater or a child abuser. Um, and so you're going to have to decline to serve and you're going to uh, want to withdraw. Um, to the, the other part of that question, when it was talking about a fraud on the court, obviously, um, standard eight, we need to protect the integrity of the mediation process. And there's an AO right on point advisory opinion 16, 2010. And in that it was an equitable distribution matter and the attorney and wife had not, um, disclosed on the form, the affidavit that's to be provided under 50 dash 21 a, um, where you have the inventory affidavit and they told the mediator up, oh, we didn't put this asset on there, but don't tell the other side. Well. You know, that's an abuse of the process. The mediator is required to try to talk them out of continuing to hide that asset. And they, they say, well, you have to keep it confidential. In that situation, if you can't talk them out of it, obviously you need to stop the mediation. Um, and then um, you, if you still can't talk them into it, you need to withdraw. Um, again, you don't communicate to the court you know, this information about, uh, you know, the fraud. Okay, so this comes to, you know, this is why I wanted to hurry to try to get this. Um, let's say it is the attorney. Um, there was a time before we had this AO um, and, and before the uh, uh, rule of professional conduct 8.3E was amended, where um, mediators all of a sudden were concerned about being ethics police, you know, was there a violation? Was the attorney doing something wrong? You have to remember that under that rule, it talks about substantive, um, uh, a substantive violation on, on that rule here. But um, um, and so as a lawyer under the rule of professional conduct, 8.3, you're supposed to report um, lawyer conduct 
that um, is a substantive violation, substantial violation. And, you know, how do you determine that? If you're the mediator, you have confidentiality, what do you do? And so uh, the DRC worked very diligently with the state bar, and now there's an exception under 8.3E for mediators that are lawyers. And it says, basically, if you reveal it, if you can reveal the information under the standards, and that would be such, let's say the lawyer's beating somebody or something, you know, obviously then you've got that except, exception under standard 3D4. And so you're required to um, uh, give that information. And then under 8.3E, it basically says, if you can give that information under the exceptions in standard three, then you have to report that conduct um, to the state bar. Otherwise, let's say it is just fraud, which is bad enough. And I actually had a case where this happened before we had all this in place. And I knew to recess and this an attorney had told his, um, his client in a bankruptcy case that it was okay to not disclose an asset. It was a house, it was a contract for sale of a house. And then we had a day long mediation and then the attorney went out to put um, money in the parking meter and the party came up to me and said, my attorney told me to do that. He told me to lie, Ooh. you know, and I was like, oh man, you, you know, uh, you know, why did you talk to me? You know, I mean, it was just, it was just horrible. And um, so, I recessed, you know, I said, you need to talk to your attorney, you you know, and, and so this information could come from that party, obviously. The other thing is you don't know if the person's telling you the truth. I recessed and then I called the chair of the commission at the time um, and I got out of the case by not saying anything about the case. I withdrew. The court was wonderful. They didn't question me. Ultimately, the trustee in the case found out. I think that party told him, um, but the information didn't come from me. And then um, uh, that that attorney, I understand, is no longer practicing. Uh, there are a lot of things going on, but you know, it really puts you in a crack. So that was fraud. That wasn't like he's getting ready to beat somebody up. And so sorry, I know we're we're running on, but okay, I'll okay. Wait before we move on, just there's one really good question on the stockbroker thing. What I just want to address it was. Uh, so you have to tell your advisor to sell, which is taking a proactive action. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I mean, it's just, it's a hard, it's, uh, that's kind of some kind of Zen issue there. I mean, you know, if you don't do anything, yeah, I mean, uh, that is making a decision, but if you tell your advisor not to sell, well, then you are using the information to your benefit. So I don't, it's just horrible. I mean, I guess just, uh, just, I, I don't know. I, I do not know. That's a very good question, but I don't. E either way, you're there's there's a problem. You know, you're either deciding not to make a decision because of what you know, or you make a decision because of what you know. So it's it's a mess. Tell tell your advisor to put everything in a blind trust right now. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Jackie, would you exercise your discretion because we only have a few minutes left and we've got two more hypotheticals. Which one do you want to attack? Um, let's see. How about three? How about three? Three. Okay. So during a Zoom mediation, various unidentified persons could be seen coming and going during the session. Obviously, uh, well, let's see. One person could be heard saying, I would not do that. They may find out. Despite the various faces appearing on the screen, the mediation seemed to be moving along with offers and counter offers being made. No one objected to the various messages since the mediator is mandated to control the conference. Can the mediator just ignore what is going on in the background? And oh. this just raises a, a bunch of questions. Uh, first one is, who is, who said that? Who's there? Um, do you always want to demand to know who's there other than the parties? Um, and what's going on? I mean, I, my, my when Jack and I first talked about it, my first thought was talk to the attorney in that room uh, and just kind of find out what's going on, who's there, tell them, Look, this is what I heard. If it's confidential, okay. Um, but you know, and and what did it mean? I mean, is it completely unrelated to the mediation? If so, fine, ignore it, move on. 
but if you're pretty sure that it did have something to do with it and it's something that um, is uh, perhaps bordering on fraud, someone is hiding information uh, like the Jackie's um, situation a while ago with uh, hiding assets, uh, you know, that raises uh, the issue that's discussed in advisory opinion 16, um, which is the hiding asset question. Um, is the attorney involved? Is there professional misconduct involved? Uh, and yeah, mainly, I think you need to find out what's going on and before you can really make a decision as to what to do. Thank you. We are out of time. I guess we'll turn this back to Tara. Thank you, Tom uh, and Jackie, to allow me to share the screen with you. Uh, you all make me look great. Well, you are great, George. Thank you.